and we're live, and the basic intro is over. I am here with Q. Q, how are you doing? I'm doing great, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Excited to get into this one. Hello, hello, Belloc. Um, he's he's fine. He's very fine. Mm. So before we hop into it, you've been on you've been on you've been on the Thomas review before, but that was with Connor. Yep. So go ahead and just give the audience because this is a trailer park symposium, a little sub project. Go ahead and just tell the listeners who you are, a little bit about yourself, and then we'll hop into it. So I am Q. Uh, Kaholith is my name. It's based on Solomon in Ecclesiastes. Uh, I am a student of economics, and I uh, find theology and philosophy to be pretty interesting. And so I'm planning to host some stuff in the future. Um, but yes, I'm a recent convert to Catholicism. I came into the church uh, August August 15th. So Wow. Right that around is, a month ago. Yeah. That's very recent. Yeah. But I've been okay. wanting to be Catholic for like two years. So I've got I've got yeah. some experience. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Well, a little bit about Hilaire Belloc, a 20th century Catholic Buddhist guy, good friends with GK Chesterton. Nickname was um old uh, hold on. I had I wrote down the nickname so I wouldn't forget it. Let me just make sure I'm getting it right. His nickname was my page is not loading. Um, hold on. Twenty bucks. Right down right here. Uh, Old Sunder. Like it was Old Sunder because he's, he's yeah, great nickname. Good, very good for the DK Chesterton. So you kind of notice he's like twenty, very twenty cents for Catholic, like DK Chesterton. Um, Chesterton once described his friendship with Hale with Spellock as a. Haleo and I could not be any further apart. We only happen to agree on everything. <laughs> Which is very funny because the more you read Belloc and Tessa, you're like, no, no, they are very different temperaments and very different um, styles of writing, but they both agree on everything. So it's it's very yeah. fun. To, um, I can't who told me, but someone so apparently a lot of people consider Hilaire Belloc to be like the first neo reactionary. Yeah. Which um, is very cool. This book is on the five great heresies Arianism, Mohammedism, Albertanianism, Protestantism, and uh, Modernism. Indeed. And so we're going to go through each chapter, different guests each time, and we're just going to live. I'm going to have a, hopefully do this, hopefully every other week do this series, and then we'll just live read it as we go. And uh, Luke, shit, <laughs> cute. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah, yeah. Q, uh, Q. It's, uh, I'm sure you've seen live readings before. So what will happen, I'll just yeah. read it, and people will suffer through my reading and my voice, and you can just comment whenever you want to say something. Uh, we should probably start by uh, talking about what Belloc defines a heresy as. Um, well, he gets into that thing in the first chapter, doesn't he? Uh, it's in the introduction. So, it's not, okay. Let me just. Yeah. Um, if you want to do any uh, preamble before I hop, start reading it, go right ahead. Okay. Let, hang on. I have it saved on my camera roll on my phone. So I no problem. Up very shortly. Okay. No problem. No one's watching right now, so we can just kind of chill. Yep. All right. Let's see. Um, okay. So. Um, oh, maybe not. Okay. So let me get it. I mean, I think you can see an introduction to heresy. So right. I have it right here on the uh, chapter. Right I know. Here. I'm trying to find. There's like a specific paragraph where he defines it. Mm. Let me make sure the link is tweeted out real quick. Yeah, I did send it to two chats, so we might get some people in. Very um, cool. You know, uh, you know, you know, natural theist, right? The kind of I think he's Jehovah's Witness. Natural theist. Um, no, I don't think I do. Is he, is he a guy on Twitter? Yeah, he's a he has a pretty big account. Um, but he added me to two chats. Mm. My Twitter has been blowing up. I have gotten a lot of followers recently. Hell Go follow yeah. Akaholith underscore underscore on Twitter. I will put your link to the uh, Twitter account in the description after we're done uh, recording. Yep. Okay, I cannot find it, so oh well. that sucks. And anyway, we'll, we'll just start live reading it, and then we'll hopefully come across it as we're going. Yep. Okay, what is a heresy? Here. What is a heresy, and what is the historical importance of such a saying? 
Like the like most modern words, heresy is used both vaguely and adversely. It is used vaguely because the modern mind is is has has adverse to precision in ideas as it is enamored in precision and measurement. <laughs> it's a great line. It's such funny. I, I laugh so hard at that, yeah. It's fantastic. <laughs> It is used diversely because according to the man who uses it, it may represent any one of 50 things. Today, I, I really like that line. It, it's almost like he's almost it's almost like how cult is used today. Like mm. cult just means any religion I don't like. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I definitely get it. like heresy is very abstract. So it's a good starting place. Yeah. Today, with most people. Of those who use the those who use the English language, the word heresy connotes bygone and forgotten quarrels and old prejudice. Against rational examination, heresy is therefore sought to be of no contemporary interest. Interest in it is dead because it deals with matter that no one takes seriously. It is understood that a man may interest himself in a heresy from archaeological curiosity, but if he affirm it that affirm that it has been of a great effect on history and still is today of living living contemporary moment, he would be hardly understood. Yeah. Um, I remember I tried to explain to some friends of mine about what the Albigensians were. Yeah. Um, they had no clue. Aryan. I mean, I, I said I said Muhammadism at one point. I was, you know, um, I had a habit of using it instead of Islam, and they're like, "What's that?" I'm like, "Oh, it's, it's, it's Islam." Yeah, same thing. Is, but is, is that just what the like historical historically what it's been called? Because I've only ever read it in, uh, I I have never heard it used in recent books. It's always been in more, uh, yeah. 18th, 19th century. I believe that I, I could be mistaken, but I believe that was like a historical label for it. I don't think it was called okay. Islam till, Interesting. till later. Um, okay. That'd be a fun thing to go down and study a bit, though, like the history of the word Muhammadism and Islam. And yes. Kind of, yep. <laughs> kill, that's, that, that could be a fun project to do later. Yep. Yeah. Where we are? Um, uh, we are at yet the subject of heresy. Yep. Yet the subject of heresy. In general, it is of the highest importance to the individual and to society. And heresy, in its particular meaning, which is that of heresy in Christian doctrine, is of special interest to anyone who would understand Europe, the character of Europe, and the story of Europe. For, for the whole of that story, since the appearance of the Christian religion, has been the story of struggle and chains, mainly preceded, yeah, preceded by often, if not always caused by and certainly accompanying diversities of religion, religious doctrine, in other words, the Christian heresy, is a special subject, the very, the very first importance to the comprehension of European history, because in company with Christian orthodoxy, it is a constant accompaniment of the accompaniment and agent of European life. You would, I would say, that's one thing I was thinking about, like when you read these 20th century European writers, whether they be British, French, Catholic, uh, German, Catholic, anything like that. There is a sense of the um, how I put this of Europe as a whole, and a sense of its relation to the thirty years, you know, the the, the um, Catholic Protestant wars, the Inquisition. There seems yeah. to be this a much more closely, like it obviously it's a little time, but they seem much more aware and closely connected to the history of those time periods. Why you right. anything coming out of Europe today, and you would just think, oh, this is some liberal guy out in California or New York or something, you know? Yeah. The um, the coats were. The cultural knowledge that has been lost by as, uh, as people like, is insane. Yeah, as syncretism and multiculturalism have kind of increased the the like overall impact, or I guess even like clarity of heresy has kind of gone away. You know, when the Muslims are invading uh, into the Christian world, like it's very obvious because you kind of have these two distinct groups, and those are like the mm. main characters. But you know, in America it's almost like impossible to kind of see these arise because it's so, well, that's in a church over in New York and this is happening to me, you know, in Wyoming, like those sorts of things, right. You just can't see it like it used to be because there's not that kind of unified principle that we used to have. Yeah. We must begin by a definition. Other definitions involve more mental effort and therefore repels. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, it does. Um, yep. Especially this uh, whole line, we must begin by definition. I, I honestly, I was just going to copy that, put that in my bio later because I'm yep. always accused of arguing semantics. <laughs> yeah, I know. And it, it's so funny to me because I, I get this accusation a lot, which is like, oh, well, you're just, you know, you're, you're, you're lawyering or you're, you're just arguing from semantics. I remember I was having an argument with, um, like, the image of Christ 
with a reformed guy who said it was wrong to make, you know, images of Christ. And he kept equivocating and he kept using words like the same word to mean three different things. And I'm, I'm trying to get him to properly define what even is an image and he can't. And he gets mad at me. He's like, you're just playing word games. I'm like, no, you, you have to be able to define image if you want to criticize it. Right. I remember when I got into a debate with Toad recently. Yeah. And, and it was this, um, he kept, kept on a Pope of communists and then he called him a leftist. So I'm like, what's, what is it? And what is a communist? Right. And after like four tweets, he's like, you just want to play word games. I'm like, no, you accuse someone of something. I need to know what you mean right. by that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is ridiculous. Toad. Yeah. Of course, Toad is a ridiculous person. Yes, of course. Yeah. Anyone, sorry, David, if you listen to this, but anyone on Tower Gangs is not worth associating with. Yeah. Well, David, David would call a toad on that, so it's not a big deal. Yeah. I think he did. I'm sorry, minus uh, Jose. I like Jose. <laughs> Jose and I, we, we don't talk anymore. We, I like Jose. Yeah. Um, here we go. Heresy is the dis- is a dis- uh, dislocation of some complete and self supporting scheme by the introduction of a novel denial of some essential part therein. I want to say that um, yeah, the novel denial of some essential part therein, I really like that part because I, I talked to a lot of um, – everyone down here where I live is a Protestant. Yep. And uh, I, I have many great Protestants. There are, there are many great Protestants here. You actually know their Protestant tradition. There are none here. <laughs> you know, their idea of – they only know – I had to explain to my Protestant friends what Protestantism was. They did some Christianity with one saying, Catholic with another saying. Yep. And then – they had to sit down and do the Bible studies on Sunday morning or Saturday night, and they invent all these insane things. And it's like, where are you getting this from? Yeah, and this is some very no- novel. Yeah, some novel idea. Like, in, in the denying something else, you know. I, I heard him. Um, so I don't know if you saw. I had an interaction uh, on Instagram with a guy named like Dort Apologetics, mm. and he's a hardcore determinist Calvinist. He does not think like any sort of free will. Most Calvinists are like compatibilists. Mm-hmm. And so I think free will exists, and I'm a compatibilist. And but no, he's a hardcore determinist, and he made a tweet, and he said, "God does not, in any sense, desire uh, that man that some people be saved. Like, so like, <laughs> God does not, in any sense, desire that all people be saved." And I, I messaged him immediately. I'm like, "Dude, have you read like First Timothy two four, where it literally just says God desires all would be saved?" And he he says. Well, that means all kinds of people. And I'm like, where where are you getting that from? That's not in the text. And he sends this like three paragraph essay where he's like, well, here's a bunch of examples where all means all kinds. And so therefore, but it's like, it's such a, you know, for all the accusations that Calvinists make against Catholics of like, oh, well, we just read the Bible and Catholics have to do all these mental gymnastics. It's like, what are you talking about? You know, um, and, but anyways, I think this definition of heresy is very good because we kind of, when we use the word heresy, it just tends to be like anybody who disagrees with us, right? Mm-hmm. And Protestants don't like being called heretics, but it is accurate, right? Protestantism took Catholicism and it removed certain parts of it, changed certain parts of it, essential elements of Catholicism, right? It's a restructuring of Catholicism. Uh, it takes it takes away the Pope. It removes that part, right? Mm-hmm. But now we still have the Bible. And that's kind of the whole authority question, right? And so, like, you're just leaving the Bible and taking out the rest of these aspects. So, like, definitionally, it's not an emotional thing. It's not our appeal to Protestants to be like, mm-hmm. you're heretics, you know, blah, 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 blah. It's literally, like, definitionally, they're removing the Catholic understanding of things and using it where it works and taking out parts where they think it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. I can't remember where I saw some great quote I saw. I think I want to say it was Spangler, but I could be mistaken on who said it. And it was um the modern mind replaces tradition with novelty. Right. And I, I can't remember who said that, but it's a fantastic quote. Um and it's very uh, very clear. Once you hear that, you can hear the scene in everything where it's like um you know, Protestantism, liberalism, anything that's new, you know, it's always a new novel and new is good. Um yeah. but Let's continue. Yep. We mean by a complete and self-supporting scheme, any system or affirmation in physics or mathematics or philosophy or whatnot, the various parts of what are coherent and sustain each other. For instance, the old scheme of physics, often called in England Newtonian, has, has having been best defined by Newton, is a scheme of this kind. The various kinds asserted therein about the behavior of matter, notably the law of gravity, are not isolated statements, but any one of what's could 
could be withdrawn at all, what was at all at was drawn at will was out just mm, <laughs> disarranging the it. West. They are all the parts of a conception or unity, sets of Zafi, but modify a part the whole scheme is put out of gear. Another example of a similar system is our plain geometry inherited to the Greeks and by and called by those who think or hope that they've got hold of a new geometry, Euclidean. Every proposition in our plane geometry that the eternal angles of a plane triangle equal two right angles, and the right and the angle contained in a semicircle is a right angle, and so forth, is not only sustained by every other proposition in the scheme, but in its turn supports each other individual part of the whole. Heresy means then the warping, 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 warping. warping of a system by expect see I see warping and I want to say I want to I, I created the Star Trek you know like moving forward <laughs> um that's just yeah the warping of a system by exception by picking out one part of the structure and implies that the scheme is married by take is marred by taking away one part of it denying one part of it and either leaving the void un unfulfilled or filling it with some new affirmation for instance the 19th century completed a scheme of textual criticism for establishing the date of an ancient document one of the principles of the scheme is that any statement of the marvelous is necessarily false when you find in any document a marvel youched mm, youched mm. vouched or wait sorry where are you Ooh. it's at y-o-u-c-h-e-d vouched youched i'm gonna say yeah yeah youched for by the supposed author of the document, you have a right to conclude, say the text of critics of the 19th century. It's all supposed to say vouched for, and it's a it's a mistype. Yeah, yeah. I think it is. Um, yeah, because yeah, that makes more sense. Vouch. I don't know what yout is in yeah. the word. I mean, it's yout, but I don't see you put past tense on yout. Um, say the text of critics of the 19th century, all talking like one man, that the document was not contemporary, was nothing was not of the date which it claimed to be. Therefore, comes along a new original critic who says, I don't agree. I think that marvelous things happen. I also think that people tell lies. A man thus buddy in is a heretic in relation to that particular orthodox system. Once you grant this exception, a number of secure negatives become insecure. Let's comment on that because that's yeah. quite, a, quite a lot. So uh, I, I really like what he says, that the warping of a system by exception. So kind of going back to this Protestant thing, right? The... The Protestants want to claim, right? Well, we have these 66 books. Um, and those seven books don't count because X, Y, Z. I mean, there's not a good defense of that, but right. And well, we want to have salvation, but it's not by works because of whatever, 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 right? That you're they're taking the parts they like, right? That the Catholic Church gave them, the the 73 books. And if you think I'm making these kind of popular level arguments, there's more to say here that I won't go into. We'll save it for, you know, another episode. But the the thing is, is right, fundamentally, the Protestant Reformation was taking, and the Protestants themselves will admit this, is taking what they didn't like about the Catholic Church and doing away with it. Now, you, don't, you might think that's the right thing to do, but it is heresy, right? You are taking away from the orthodoxy of the structure. So... Yeah. And then um, I, I do really like um, I do like his description of a uh, textual criticism because it's it's actually pretty fire um, of like this this thing of like oh well anytime you find in a document something that seems absurd right well it's fake you know uh, a great example comes to mind of um, Jesus healing the man at the, uh, the fountain right where he rubs mud in his eyes and there's like well these are, there's these five fountains and or five um, is it like five arches or something about the fountain and everybody thought oh john put this in here for theological reasons because you know this number is significant well no we dug up the thing and it had the thing described in and so like textual criticism basically just becomes well you know this crazy thing can't possibly just mean that Jesus, in fact, did feed the 5,000. It has to mean that, you know, well, there was like this complex, like this is what um, Richard Carrier does a lot, right? Mm. Where he'll he'll like, well, Jesus is really a moon cosmic deity god. <laughs> like, like, because, and I, I, you, he's debated Trent Horn on this. Um, and it, I, I encourage you, go look up Richard Carrier versus Trent Horn debate. It is the funniest shit I've ever seen. Like, it is hilarious because the stuff he draws out is insane. Anyways, all that aside, textual criticism is stupid in a lot of ways. 
It's Sorry, not a mosquito. Really Sorry, there's yep. a mosquito I'm trying to get. It's not good. There's a hole in my window because of the storm, and I haven't got it repaired yet. So mosquitoes are just flying in. Um, hole in the yes. white trash RV. Yes, hole in the white trash symposium. We have we have the walls have been breached. Okay, it's all over from here. Mm. Let's get back to it. Yep. You were, you were certain, for instance, the life of St. Martin of Tours, which professed to be a, by a contemporary witness, was not by a contemporary witness because of the marvels it was cited. But if the new principle be admitted, it might be contemporary after all, and therefore something to which it bore witness, in no way marvelous, but not found in any other document, may be accepted as historical. You read the life of... I've, I've tried to figure out how to pronounce this one. I even listened to it pronounced, but I can't remember how it goes. Um I'm a tourish. I don't know. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm we're going to go with that one. That he is what he weighs a man from the dead in the Basilica of Vienna in AD 500. The Orthodox schools of criticism would say that the whole story being obviously false because marvelous, because marvelous. It is no evidence of the existence of a basilica in Vienna at that date. But your, her but your heretic, who disputes the Orthodox canon of criticism, says it seems to me that the biographical biographer of the um, I say it one more time. Um, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm Sound to out. Wait, Sound I'm, modes? I, how do you spell Thumos? It's Thumos. Dude, you asked me what spell I want to play on it. I have no fucking clue. Okay, okay. So no, okay. So I think it is um, Thamutur, uh, Thamutur, I, I don't know. I, I'm guessing it's kind of. Wait, where's Vienna? Is Vienna in Italy? Uh, yes, it is. I don't want to sound like a retarded white guy, so I'm kind of trying to. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure we has in Italy. I could be. Uh, yeah, I think Thamatours. Um, Thamatours. It, it doesn't matter too much. Yeah. yeah. Well, before the Thamatours may have been telling lies, but he would not have mentioned the basilica and the date unless contemporaries knew as well as he did that there was a basilica in Vienna at that date. Falsehood does not presuppose falsehood in a narrator. There must even come along a still bolder heretic who should say that not only is the passage perfectly good evidence for the existence of a basilica in Vienna in AD 500, but I think it's possible that a, ma that a man was raised from the dead. If you follow either of these critics, you are upsetting the whole scheme of tests whereby true history was sifted from false and textual criticism of recent times. The denial of a scheme wholesale is not heresy and has not the creative power of a heresy. It is on... It is of the essence of heresy that it leaves standing a great part of the structure it attacks. On this account, it can be a, it can appear to believers and continue to affect their lives through deflecting them from their original character. Wherefore, it is said of heresies that they survive by the truths they retain. That entire little section right there, incredible. Yeah. Well, and, and again, it, I, I think it like this. This really does feel directed. I mean, it could definitely apply to Islam. As well, but like this does feel a lot directed to Protestantism, right? Um, especially this part here about um, on this account, it can appeal to believers and continues to affect their lives uh, through deflecting them from their original characters, right? Like this whole idea of Protestantism is like, well, we just have you know, we just have seven less books than you, and you know, well, we agree, you know, Jesus is our savior. I mean, you see this with Mormons as well, right? Mormons do the same kind of appeal, right? Well, you know, we, we believe, right, that Jesus came and all this stuff, and you can find that common ground and pull in. Uh, Muslims do this, right? Oh, well, we agree God is one. You know, there's only one God. But, like, you you believe all this stuff, right? It's like, so, I mean, Albigensians aren't really relevant to today's modern discussion. But, so, like, this is definitely the kind of people he had in mind. Mm -hmm. And even atheists, atheists will do this too, right? Especially kind of these Dawkins types, right? The murder is wrong thing. Oh, well, yeah. we don't need to disagree, you know, if there's an objective way to tell if murder is wrong, right? We can just, we both know it. We both assume it, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm really looking forward to getting into the fifth chapter on this podcast on um, right. on, 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 on modernism because that's going to be, uh, has, if you listen to this, you have to have your laptop fixed by then. Because I, I will not finish this without has. Has has to be for that last chapter because right. that's, gonna, that's just going to be perfect. Okay. Um, let's continue. We must note that whether the complete scheme just attacked be true or false is indifferent to the value of heresy as a department of historical study. What we are concerned with is the highly interested in truths that uh, heresy originates a new life of its own and vitally, effect, vitally affects the society it attacks. 
The reason that men combat heresy is not only principally conservatism, a devotion to routine, a dislike of disturbance in the habits of thought, it is much more a perception that the heresy, insofar as it gains ground, will produce a way of living and a social character at issue with, irritating, and perhaps mortal to the way of living and the social character produced by the old orthodox scheme. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> it, 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 that's, that's me reading most uh, like 20th century Catholics. I'm like, yep, that's a good point, dude. Thank you. Thank yep. you for giving me that. Right. Mm-hmm. Nothing to comment. You're, yep, you're correct. <laughs> so much for the general meaning and interest in the most pregnant word, heresy. Its particular meaning, the meaning in which it is used in this book, is the merits, mer- marring, marring by exception of the complete scheme of the Christian religion. For instance, that religion has for one essential part, though it is only a part, the statement that the individual soul is immortal, that personal consciousness survives physical death. Now, if people believe that they look at the world and themselves in a certain way and go in a certain way and are people of a certain sort, if they expect that it is cut that it that if they expect that is cut out, this one doctor may continue to hold all the others. But the scheme is changed. The type of life and character and the rest become quite other. The man who is certain that he is going to die for good, and all, and for all may believe, and for all may believe that Jesus of Nazareth was a very good, was very God of very God. That God is triune, and that the incarnation was accomplished by a virgin birth, that bread and wine are transformed by a particular formula. He may recite a great number of Christian prayers and admire and copy chosen Christian exemplars, but he will be quite a different man from the man who takes immortality for granted. I really like this point here, but specifically the um, let me say it's highlighted here is no, Paul, you need to be saying this once, one thing, you say things one minor saying the effect that has on the whole an action and how you live your life is uh, drastic. Um, and it's, I think it's a little bit of an issue I have with certain Protestants because I'll talk to my Protestant friends or I'll talk to my, my parents, for example. Um, and one of the things they'll say is like, well, as long as you just believe in Jesus, we're all fine. And again, so to a percent, yes, you are correct. As long as you have a valid baptism, yes, you, that is that is correct. Right. But to the extent that the actions and the way you will live your life are different by comparison to when you have confession, when you have the sacrament, when you have mortal and venial sins, when you have right. transubstantiation, the effects of how you behave in life with all those things, with, with guardian angels, with St. Michael, with all these different things, how they affect you everyday actions are drastic. And it's just the, um, yeah, you can have the mere basic, the mere Christianity, the mere minimalist Christianity, and so you have a valid baptism and be fine. But the things are missing out on, and the things that are change so drastically by just getting rid of these, um, as Gavin Orton says, excrescence. Yeah. Um, excrescence. Not, you know, whatever. Um, and, that, and that goes both ways too, right? You know, Protestants, if you're, for any Protestant that watches this, you know, the Catholic faith has more stuff and there's great benefit that comes out of it. You know, I think one of the biggest things that has helped me spiritually has been Marian devotion. Mm-hmm. And that's not something you have in Protestantism. Like, and the, you know, I know there are like Anglo Catholics, right. Who will be like, well, no, no, no. You know, we have all this. Yeah. I mean, again, that I go back more to authority, but you know, for the majority of Protestants, the vast, vast majority who did not have Marian devotion of any kind, that is, a big game changer mm-hmm. and so it's like those sorts of things you you do see a big difference um and it's also a cascading effect right um i know a lutheran who has gone from lutheran to presbyterian you know and if he went non-denominational it wouldn't shock me right because mm-hmm. the the thing is is that you know oh well we've only removed this one little thing but what's the next little thing right oh it's well it's, it's not transubstantiation it's consubstantiation Oh, well, now it's just, you know, memorialism. Like, those things follow because you lose more and more and more. You know, once you deny the efficacy of the sacraments, well, why not just go full symbolic, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of the natural consequence of things. It is. Excuse me. Because heresy, in this particular sense, the denial of an accepted Christian doctrine, just affects the individual, it affects all society. And when you're examining a society formed by a particular religion, you necessarily concern yourself to the utmost with the warping of the, or the ministry of that religion. It is the historical interest of heresy. It is why anyone who wants to understand how Europe came to be and how its changes have been caused cannot afford to treat heresy as unimportant. The ecclesiastics 
Ecclesiastics, 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 that's the word. The Ecclesiastics who fought so furiously over the details of definition in the Eastern Councils had far more historical sense and are far more in touch with reality than the French skeptics mirrored to English readers through their disciples Gibbon. Now, I don't know who Gibbon is. Do you? Yeah, I don't know who that is. It, 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 there's probably some historical stuff there. But I mean, yeah. just, again, look, look at Protestantism again, right? <laughs> hey, the American Revolution, right, with the Puritans and yeah. the, the Protestants. <laughs> Look at where, you know, it is not just religion. It's going to affect all out Floyd's life, you know. Um, there's a reason that it, there's kind of this whole continuum, right? There's a reason Plato starts with the city and then goes to the individual in Plato's Republic, mm -hmm. right? Because the way the individual functions, that's going to affect society as a whole, right? And vice versa. And so when you have, when you have these, the Protestant idea, this kind of ethos of, you know, there's kind of this individual sense of Christianity. Christianity is not an individualistic religion, but people have taken Christianity to be like that. And it's affected American culture to the point right now where we have multiculturalism and syncretism and all these other things, right. Mm -hmm. that negatively affect the culture. It's not just one thing, you know, yeah. speaking of multiculturalism, uh, anyone listening, go pick up uh, Paul Godfrey's uh, multiculturalism and uh, uh, secular theocracy. I think that's the title of that book. And pick, uh, go find Hagfist on Twitter, who wrote an incredible article on um, multiculturalism for the Hoppian or uh, Hoppian.org. I believe it's a live reading on this channel. So definitely, multiculturalism. Um, it's not. It's not a word used anymore in modern liberal circles, but it is. It was. It was. It, was, it is. It was, it was used, and I think it's obviously um, still a saying. So everyone, go, definitely go look into that more if you want to. Um, let's see here. A man who thinks, for instance, that Arianism is a mere discussion of words and does not see that an Arian word would have been much more like a Mohammedan word than what the European word actually became, he is much less in touch with reality than Athanasius when he affirmed the point of doctrine to be all important. That local council in Paris was tipped the scales in favor of the Trinitar Trinitarian tradition with much effect to the decisive battle, and not to, be un not to understand that is to be a poor historian. I feel like that's one thing I really um I like that the well I, I, I went ahead I really like how he goes through not just the heresy itself from like a theological lens he does go into like the political side of the um you now when he get, when he gets an Arianism he gets into like the Roman government and the Roman military and what Arian effect had on that you know I really like that he doesn't just go to heresy on this point here like heresy don't just affect you know some theological doctrine in the air it does affect actual actions and um you know, political situations. I like that he goes into that more in this, in this book. I'm really looking forward to covering that on the series. Right. Um, it is no answer to such a thesis to say that both the Orthodox and the heretic were suffering from illusion, that they were discussing matters which had no real existence and were not worth the trouble of debate. The point is a doctrine and its denial were formative to the nature of man and the natures so formed to determine the future of the society made up of those men. Those men. There was another consideration in this connection with those too often admitted in our life, in our time. It is this that the special the skeptical attitude upon transcendental sayings cannot for masses of men endure. It has been the despair of many that this should be so. They de deplore the despicable weakness of mankind, which compels the, ex accept the exception of some philosophy or some religion in order to carry on life at all. But we we have here a matter of positive and universal experience. Indeed, there is no denying it. It is mere fact human society cannot carry on without some creed because a code and a character are the product of a creed. Yeah. Anything to add? Um, I guess I'd just say, you know, it's it's sort of the same question. Right. You know, do you need a creed? This is a Protestant question a lot. Um, there's some Protestants who are like, well, uh, no creeds. You know, I'm just a Christian. I don't need any councils or whatever. That That is a creed. You are always going to have some sort of belief system because all creeds are right. It's just a statement of belief system. Right. Uh, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Right. That is all just belief. And so when you say no creeds, that's a creed, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. there is there is a way you think about the world no matter who you are no matter what belief you hold and that is how you're going to live your life right your beliefs mm -hmm. don't exist in a vacuum yeah absolutely 
in point of fact, true individuals, especially those who have led sheltered lives, can often carry on with minimum of certitude or habit upon transgender things. An organic ma human mass cannot uh, cannot so carry on. Just a whole religion sustains modern England and the religion of the religion of patriotism. Destroy destroy that, and men by some heretical by some heretical development by expecting. The doctrine that as man's prime duty is towards the political society to which he belongs, and England, as we know it, would gradually cease to become something as a <laughs> <laughs> what a what a prediction. Wow. I'm sure that'll never happen. I'm so sure, I'm so sure he was just some you know pessimist who had no idea what the future was gonna be like. No no idea what's happening. Now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I gotta say, as I've studied more European history, you know, of, of like Napoleon, France, and of uh, England, England, for history, looking at France and England now, it's just heartbreaking. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's like you guys were so cool. You guys like were like just you've just gone down the toilet. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's just sad. For now, I'm holding out hope for a new Napoleon. And Nick Land agrees with me. Nick Land believes for France would be the first place the overted window collapses, and I agree I, with him. I I almost. Mm. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to save my thoughts. I don't know. I, I haven't looked into it enough to know. Yeah. My, my only argument is that, is that I, I believe there's a Catholic revival happening on the outskirts of France, not in the cities, but on the outskirts. And I think Corsica, um, was, I, I love Corsica because it's where Napoleon's from. Um, I don't know. That's going to be, I don't know why, but my gut tells me Corsica is going to play a role in the future. I don't know where it belongs to anymore, if it's Italian or France. I don't know. But I bet money on Corsica. That's just a gut. I feel it in my bones. Someone's coming out of Corsica within the next hundred years to sort of fix things in France. I bet money on that. I have no justification besides a gut reaction. Um, it was revealed to me in a dream or something, but it's, it's going to happen. I believe it. Heresy, then, is not a fossil subject. It is a subject of permanent and vital interest to mankind because it is bound up with the subject of religion without some form of what no human society has ever has endured or ever can endure. Those who think that the subject of heresy may be neglected because the term sounds too sounds to them, sounds to them old fashioned and because of because it is connected with a number of disputes long abandoned in making the common air of thinking and words. Instead of ideas, it is the same sort of air which contract, contrasts America as a republic and England as a monarchy. Whereas, of course, the government of the United States is essentially monarchic and the government of England is essentially republican and aristocratic. There is no end to the misunderstanding which arises from the uncertain use of words. <laughs> yeah, right there. I'm just going to copy that one. <laughs> um, but if we keep in mind the plain fact that a state a human policy or a general culture must be inspired by some body of mores and that there can be no body of mores without a doctrine. And if we agree to call any constant, consistent body of mores and doctrine and religion, then the importance of a heresy as a subject will become clear. Because heresy means nothing else than proposal of novelties in religion by picking out from what has been the accepted religion some point or other, denying the same or replacing it by another doctrine hitherto unfamiliar. Yeah, that's he's he's just fantastic. You know, when he's nothing to comment on in live winning, you just yeah. gotta comment how great the guy is, you know? Yep. The Chad. Mm -hmm. The study of successive Christian heresies, the characters and faith has a special interest to all those who belong to the European or Christian culture. And that is a reason that ought be self evident. All culture has made by was was made by religion, changes in or deflection from that religion necessarily affect our civilization as a whole. I really like that part. <laughs> Changes in or deflections from that world doesn't necessarily affect our civilization as a whole. Right. And I really, I um, I know I haven't read the modernity chapter yet, but I'm really curious to see what the argument is that it's a Christian heresy. It's, it's a heresy. Yep. Um, I think if I had to guess, um, based on this example earlier, but you know, like oh, we we still agree on most things. We just kind of yeah. change some things. I right. feel like every time I bring up um. Religion now with people. The, the I I do I can't stand it, but I hear it all the time. Isn't religion? Doesn't religion just boil down to don't be an asshole? And it's like, what? No, <laughs> no, it doesn't. That's like, that's like the minimum. <laughs> like, it's, it, it, it's people like to really, you know, it, for as much as crap as we give inspiring philosophy about his views on politics, <laughs> um, you know, he's absolutely right on this. Like. You cannot separate these kind of extrinsic benefits of Christianity and religiosity 
from their fundamental kind of core, right? Mm -hmm. Where they came from. Nobody, like, there is a reason that people who are not religious are more likely to murder. It's because of the religion. It's not, oh, they fabricated some story. Like, you have this whole central system and you cannot take it out, right? Like, the only way that you're going to get otherwise is you get to kind of like what Sam Harris advocates for. And it's basically Brave New World. Like, it's it's literally the book of Brave New World. Like, yeah. oh, we're just going to we're just going to kill people who are bad. <laughs> like, we're just going to act like they're a virus on a human body. Like, have you ever read his book, The Moral Landscape? Uh, I've. I've seen excerpts from it and I've okay. seen people talk about it. I've not had the detriment of reading it. <laughs> I have. Um because okay. my I, I have because my friend was a very my friend and his dad was a very big Sam Harris fan, and I was like, this is ridiculous. I gotta read his book, yes. Yeah. It's all it ridiculous. There's a part of the book that people don't talk about often, but I think it's hilarious. Is he um he argues how do sci um it's like how is this not this scientism and having science replace the priest replace the, uh, the churches? It's not because science is real. It's basically his argument. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just like that's your what? <laughs> you're yeah. okay, whatever. Um, I'm gonna make another drink real quick. You just keep reading from where you left off because you said you could, you could take over. So if, um, you just okay, pick yeah. up from where you left off. I'm gonna, I'll make a drink real quick. And go back. Okay, wait, wait, okay, let's see. Um, we left off on the whole story of Europe for various realms. Okay, yeah. I scrolled down a little too far. I'm gonna take a quick break to blow my nose and I'll be right back. <laughs> Okay, I'm back. All right, I'll start reading. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'm just going to make me a tennis flight. <laughs> the whole story of Europe, her various realms and states and general bodies during the last 16 centuries, has mainly turned upon the successive heresies arising in the Christian world. We are what we are today mainly because no one of these heresies finally... Or, sorry, because no one of these her of those heresies finally overset our ancestral religion. But we are also what we are because each of them profoundly affected our fathers for generations. Each heresy left behind its traces, and one of them, the great Mohammedan movement, remains to this day in dogmatic force and preponderant over a great fraction of territory, which was once wholly ours. So, Tenth Crusade, um, <laughs> if one were to, cat uh, to catalog heresies marking the whole long story of Christendom, the list would be almost endless. They divide and subdivide. They are on every scale. They vary from the local to, to the general. Their lives extend from less than a generation to centuries. The best way of understanding the subject is to select a few prominent examples and by, um, and by the study of these to understand of what vast import heresy may be. I'm gonna guess he meant importance. I think EWTN has some bugs. So yeah, yeah. I, I, I it's the first one I popped up on the link. I will probably find a better link for going forward. But um, I, I I'm in a library right now. I was gonna try to find the book, but I I didn't. I ran out of time. So I'm I'm so I talked to some of y'all in the group. Some of y'all in the group chat. You know, talk about your like your university libraries that have all these amazing books. Yeah, my library has my like my local library has one book involving anything related to Catholicism and it's Bishop Barron's Catholicism, which is a good book. Don't get me wrong. But it's literally the only thing that they don't even have any St. Augustine. Yeah. There's, there's no Augustine. They have no they have they have a whole section of Islamic books, but a whole section of Christian books, but nothing involving no no yep. saints, nothing. I'm just like it's um it's a travesty. So thank goodness for PDF drives. All right. Yes. Such a study. I, I, you, want, you want to keep going with me to take a I'll keep going. I'll keep going. Yeah that's right. Sounds good. Such a study is the easier from such a study is e is the easier. It's so weird from the fact that our fathers recognized heresy for what it was, gave it in each case a particular name, subjected it to a definition and therefore to limits, and made its analysis easier by such definition. I cannot stress how um, um, important. I think yep. you would agree with me how important it is to have strict definitions of uh, ideals. Yep, especially um, heresy. Especially like, heresy. Like. Just I keep going back to the Protestant movement because it's such a like case in point. It is Exhibit A, right? Like, pro the ecu. I, I'm not opposed to ecumenicism, mm -hmm. but we've taken it. It seems almost to a point where we're basically blurring the lines so much that we've allowed Protestants say to say, "Well, we're basically you guys," and 
that's not to say I don't, you know, love my Protestant brothers mm-hmm. and sisters. So I have a good number of Protestant friends who I greatly respect. I, well, we are both in a Gavin. great group chat with amazing Protestant people. Right. And, and Mine I respect, is Zachary, whatever his name is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I, res- okay. I, res- <laughs> I respect, uh, I, I respect Gavin Orton. You know, I respect, um, uh, uh, oh, what's his name? NC Wright. You know, like mm-hmm. these are scholars who, you know, William and Craig even, I owe my conversion to but William Lane Craig, whether we like it or not, is a heretic, and we have to recognize him as such, and we have to ask ourselves, right, is this really the path we should go down in terms of ecumenicism, or should we recognize, you know, we have common enemies, we should deal with this first, you know, like, mm-hmm. I am fine fighting with a Protestant alongside each other on abortion, but once we get into that theological range, we got to be kind of careful with the ecumenicism, right? Mm-hmm. Like we can't let it become oh, we're basically the same because we're just not. We're never going to be. What's that Dostoevsky quote when uh, that Matt Frad brings up all the time? It's like when is a uh, about ba- uh, a robber at the door, feuding brothers reconcile? Right. Um, and I think that's a good quote. I think it's Dostoevsky. I'm ninety eight percent sure. Uh, uh, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good quote. Um, but I I don't. I think what's missing from that quote is that they stop the fighting to deal with the sweat. They don't necessarily reconcile. Right. You know, I think that's something that kind of gets missing in the point where that quote is brought up. Um, real quick, slight detour. You were, conver- you were converted by uh, William Lane Craig? Uh, when I was an atheist. I didn't know you were an atheist. So, hmm. so yeah, I can give a little bit of my personal. Yeah, let's, so let's, I was ra- let's dive into oh, that real quick. It's actually Peter Kraft, apparently, who, who said maniac at the door. That's even better because I, I love Kraft. Yeah, well, Kraft, yeah, Con- Connor's gonna love that. <laughs> he's um, one of the best. <laughs> yes. Anyways, so no, so I was I was raised kind of evangelical. Um, my whole family's still evangelical. I'm the only one who converted to Catholicism. <laughs> but I became an atheist. You know, I, it was like the edgy mm-hmm. ninth grade kind of conversion that everyone uh-huh. has, and it's like. You know, William Lane Craig was a massive influence of me getting out of that. Like his, I think everybody has seen it, like the Hitchens Craig debate at Biola. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, life changing. Like, that was one of the biggest things that I clearly remember. And I don't remember yeah. that much from it. And so it's like, but the more I've gone on and Craig, I've listened to like Craig debate like Trinitarianism with Dale Tuckey and Craig just sucks. Like, it's, it's bad. And it's like, he, he just wants to make the Trinity like, this like super simplistic, no no strings attached definition, mm-hmm. and he just got destroyed by Dale Tucky. Like it was embarrassing to watch. Yeah. Like I was genuinely embarrassed for him, <laughs> and it's that kind of thing, right? I'm fine recommending William Lane Craig to a beginner who needs to get into apologetics, but I I always say you know stay away. You kind of gotta mm-hmm. you gotta back off. Listen to this guy on theology. You yeah. know I wouldn't recommend. Ludwig von Mises in a discussion about materialism, right? Like, like I would recommend him on economics, but those sorts of things I think are just super important. We have to realize it. Yeah, absolutely. Slight one more question before we dip it back into the store, back into the book. Uh, just out of curiosity, have you read uh, Ludwig von Mises' book Socialism yet? No, I haven't yet. I'd get on that one. That is that is the Dude, that is the, that so is. Much. I, I already know. have to read Plato's Republic for philosophy, dude, and that kicks my butt, dude. I read dude, for two hours today. Dude, that's a Plato's Republic is one of the best books ever read. It, no, it's, it's great. It's just it's so dense. <laughs> yeah, and it's um, a lot of reading. So yeah, before before we get into this, I want to say the best book in the entire like Austrian tradition is Mises' book on socialism. That is the best book. That is actually why I, I can't. Know. Much as I want this, I just, much as I distance myself from Austrian economics, that book for Mises is just perfect yeah. like over 100 years ago he settled the socialist debate there was it's, yeah. it's over it's just people holding on for dear life trying to maintain yeah. socialism i don't know I, I i'm an austrian i just don't agree with libertarianism yeah those two things are not conceptually separate i'm happy to debate anyone on that um <laughs> you you can totally be an austrian and not a libertarian okay all right anyways uh, so back, wait back to this. uh unfortunately okay so unfortunately in the modern world The habit of such a definition has been lost. The word heresy, having come to connotate something odd and old-fashioned, is no longer applied to cases which are clearly cases of heresy and ought to be treated as such. Protestantism. (laughs) Uh, For instance, there is abroad today a denial of what theologians call dominion, that is, the rights of property. So we're getting into communism now. Uh, Mm -hmm. It is widely affirmed that 
laws permitting the private ownership of land and capital are immoral, that the soil of all goods which are productive should be communal, and that any system leaving their control to individuals or families is wrong and therefore to be attacked and destroyed. What a fire description of communism. Mm -hmm. Right. This is... And it was the failure to recognize the threat of communism, you know, that led to the overthrow of Russia. Oh, shoot. Sorry. I just. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. But man, if, you, if, you, if you take Hoppe's definition of uh, communism, then Hilaire Belloc being a distributist was a communist. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. But like, <laughs> well, that, that's a little bit too far. But yeah. <laughs> I just thought it's so hard. I, the month I love Hoppe, that is a really bad definition. <laughs> Yeah, um, it's um well, it, it's helpful if you're a, if you're a libertarian. He, yes, that is how that is what Hoppe is. He is incredible if you're a libertarian, and yeah. if you're not libertarian, he's still great. But he is just like the what's a sensing example here? He's 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 basically I don't want to call him the Marx of libertarianism because that's mean, and I, I don't think it's accurate. He's much more enjoyable than Marx, but I don't know. Man. He, I, actually, I actually, I like reading Marxists. I enjoy Marxists. Yeah. Hoppe Marx is actually really fun. Yeah. Um, but I, I would, I would just say, you know, Hoppe is very much, I'm trying to think of someone who's kind of analogous on another side. Yeah. Hoppe is almost like, um, Man, okay, I'm having trouble to give a definition. He's yeah. very much like a – he is the Aquinas of libertarianism, mm -hmm. I would say. Like because Aquinas kind of took Aristotle and Augustine and he made this very neat system mm -hmm. of Christian theology. And Hoppe took Mises and Rothbard and made this very neat system of libertarianism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes when you read Aquinas, you're like, oh my gosh, this is like the most brilliant thing I've ever read. And then sometimes you read Aquinas and you're like, I'm sorry, <laughs> like that's a little okay. Um, yeah. And so it's like, it's one of those things you just kind of have to take it as it goes. Okay. Yeah. Um, let's get back into it. Right. That doctrine already very strong among us and increasing in strength and the number of its adherents, we do not call a heresy. We think of it only as a political or economic system. And when we speak of communism, our vocabulary does not suggest anything theological. But this is only because we have forgotten what the word theological means. Communism is as much as a heresy as Manichaeism. It is the taking away from the moral scheme by which we have lived in a, of a particular part, the denial of that part, and the attempt to replace it by an innovation. The communist retains much of the Christian scheme, human equality, the right to live, and so forth. He denies a part of it only. The same is true of the attack on the indissolubility of marriage. No one calls the mass... Uh, the mass of modern practice and affirmation upon divorce a heresy, but a heresy it, it it clearly is because its determining characteristic is the denial of the Christian doctrine of marriage and the substitution, therefore, of another doctrine, to wit, that marriage is but a contract and a terminable contract. <laughs> that is beautiful. He's he's beautiful. great. Yes. When we finish this one, we're gonna have to either do um, his book on the Crusades or his book on the Protestant Reformation. Right. Yeah. I'm I'm committing to this now. This next upcoming like season, not season, but like, next upcoming season of like episodes I'm doing, all going to be Hilaire Belloc live readings. I'm yep. committing to that because like, he's he. Our oh, Thomas view is going down to 20th century man. We're going. We're doing 20th century Catholicism. What we're doing on this on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Jacques Maritain, Hilaire Belloc, Gary Gulagans. Let's just let's do it. Chesterton, Chesterton of course. Yeah. We could even Con do Lewis. Mm. Connor and I got a live read some Chesterton and. Kobe. Kobe is really good with Chess, and I gotta get those two guys on for a podcast on that. We still gotta read um uh De Regno as well, although that one's a little bit. <laughs> that's just uh, right. quite as a timeless. <laughs> yep. Let's continue. He, he would be a great 20th century writer. It would be even he, better. Oh dude, Aquinas was benefited. Uh, the universe, the uh, the heretics are lucky there was no maids of heresy around the time of Aquinas. <laughs> the parts are love lucky. To see Aquinas Aquinas today. Today. It would be so funny. He, he wouldn't be on Twitter, but he'd be in he might have been Aquinas around the same time as Martin Luther, like the same decade, yep. the same period. Oh. How incredible that would have been. <laughs> let's, let's continue. You, you've made me you've made me depressed now that this didn't actually happen. Um <laughs> All right. Equally, it is a heresy, a change by exception, to affirm that nothing can be known upon divine things, that all is mere opinion, and that therefore things made certain by the evidence of the senses and by experiment should be our only guides in arranging human affairs. Take that, Soren Kierkegaard. Uh, those who think thus may and commonly do retain much of Christian morals. 
but because they deny certitude from authority, which doctrine is a part of Christian epistemology. They are heretical. Wow. Um, I did not know that I was not the first person to use the word Christian epistemology. Um, <laughs> so this is what I talk about a lot um, in terms mm -hmm. of, he's talking about morals, but I talk about authority in terms of epistemology. Mm -hmm. um, where like to determine kind of interpretation of the Bible and doctrines that flow from the interpretation, you have to have this epistemic grounding mm -hmm. and authority. And I'm an epistemology like, nerd. I a hundred percent agree. Right. Yeah. And so it's like, and, and really you can, deductively demonstrate Catholicism is the best system by which to do that, or at least inductively. Mm -hmm. And that like, that is a massive point in favor that you see when you, when you, what heresy fundamentally does is it kind of destroys the system because once you remove some of the building blocks, right, the whole thing tumbles, you're basically just sitting on a precipice, right? What are you going to do Protestants when an atheist asks you, why are these books in the Bible? What are you going to do? How are you going to justify that the that revelation is a book of scripture and not merely apocalyptic writing? Mm -hmm. Like, what are you going to do? And Catholics have an easy answer. It's easy. <laughs> Protestants, no. I have not yeah. heard a convincing argument from anyone, including Gavin Orland or Michael Kruger. It's it's the biggest it's the biggest issue. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of epistemology, anyone listening, if you want to really get into epistemology, um, uh, Einkass and Bo Kakal's Behemoths are doing an incredible series breaking down chapter and chapter of Jacques Maritain's book, Degrees of Knowledge, Degrees which of is, knowledge. in my opinion, the greatest book on epistemology ever written. Yep. I, I don't want to, I've read, I've read most, I'm reading along with them, but not commenting on it because I don't understand it. So you read the chapter, <laughs> then you listen to them explain, and you go, oh, I get this now because they're way smaller than me. Um, so everyone definitely subscribe and go find their podcast and listen to that. They are. It's a fantastic series. It, it's a really good it series. The, the treatment on physics is hilarious. Um, Ein is so accurate. Good. Ein is so good when it comes to explaining the physics side of things. He's yeah. just – he's fantastic. Yeah. Okay. We are living today under a regime of heresy with only this to distinguish it from the older periods of heresy, that the heretical spirit has become generalized and appears in various forms. It will be seen that I have in the following pages talked of the modern attack because some name must be given to a thing before one can discuss it at all. But the tide which threatens to overwhelm us is so diffused that each of us must give it his own name. It has no common name as of yet. So he's talking about modernism. Mm -hmm. Anything to add there? No, not particularly. I think okay. um, we'll get into that one when we get into the, uh, the final chapter. Right. Okay. It will be seen that I have in the following pages talked of this modern attack because some name must be given to a thing before one can discuss it at all. But the tide which threatens to overwhelm us is so diffuse. Oh, wait, sorry, I already read this. My bad. All good. All right. um, perhaps that will come, but not until the conflict between the modern anti-Christian spirit and the permanent tradition of the faith becomes acute through persecution and the triumph or defeat thereof. It will then perhaps be called antichrist. The word is derived from the Greek verb hero which first meant I grasp or I seize and then came to me and I take away and we can sure end. <laughs> and the, and what a the end, beautiful end. Fantastic. fantastic. So, so I, I think, I think we can be done for tonight. I yeah. just kind of in closing, let's talk about that last paragraph. So oh, yeah. he, he does a really brilliant job of predicting what's going to happen in the future. Right. Mm -hmm. You have, he says the faith becomes acute through persecution, right? Well, what are we seeing in this country today, right? The mass murder of children, you know, rampant degeneracy, all of these sorts of things. And you are starting to see kind of a Christian pushback, right? Greater, well, hopefully we'll start to see it more and more, but greater church attendance, right? Mm -hmm. Greater amount of traditional church attendance, not just kind of this lovey-dovey, you know, oh, well, you know, I to, just, um, I, I'm spiritual, you know. To reference uh, Scott Hahn's newest book, Holy is His Name, um, he puts uh, L-U-V is not enough as a chapter. Yeah. chapter. Uh, anyone listening, definitely pick up his book on heresy. It is, not uh, heresy, um, on holiness. It is fantastic. Yep. But, um, yeah, it's, I'm I'm very excited again to accept this book. It's um, I was I, I got a free audible token and I picked it out because um, Paris recommended Bel Belloc. And I, since, since the, by the end of the second chapter, I'm like, I got a lot. We, we got a lot. Read this one. 
I, I, I started doing a book club, but no, 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 it's just too big. We got to live read it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Make sure you guys subscribe for it. Um, well, I'll real quick, if anyone wants to, hear more, wants to learn more about Belloc himself, if you have Scribd, there's a biography of him. Um, but what, what's one is the one that's written by somebody else? Is that auto or by, what's one is the, um, I know what you're talking about. I always forget which one it is. Biography and autobiography. I think biography is written by somebody else. Autobiography is written by yourself. Yes, yeah, no, that's right, yes. Okay. Uh, it's called Old Sunder, A Life of Hilaire Belloc by Joseph Pierce. It's on Squibb. It's very good. Um, apparently, one of the reasons everyone, one of the series why Belloc was so pessimistic and upset is because he was going to become a college professor and they turned him down for it because he was Catholic. And so he just became, kind of became pissed and went on a rant against everyone. So he could have been a professor. So his books could have been professor, doctor, something, wow. Belloc. <laughs> and so I, um, all, all the- game, right? <laughs> The, the thing men do when they're like told they can't do something, like <laughs> it's so funny because there's like such degrees. Belloc did a good thing. Belloc helped out. You know, uh, other less reasonable men build, uh, you know, tank, um, oh, tank bulldozers and destroy cities and fly planes up into the sky. But, you know, Belloc is just like, screw you guys. I'm going to be Aquinas. <laughs> like, <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Well- uh, Q, thank you so much for coming on. This was a lot of thank fun. Thank you much for having me. Follow, uh, go and give you plugs. Follow the Twitter. Follow at Koholith underscore underscore on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, go to the Substack. I think it should be linked on the Twitter. If it's not, I'll do that tonight. I discuss, uh, I'm starting to discuss more Protestant epistemology. Um, I'm planning to do some pretty comprehensive writing on that sometime in the future. I have another article on why the state is justified. Uh, from a Christian libertarian perspective um, and why you should be a theocrat if you're a Christian anarchist or libertarian. So that's all checking out. Uh, I'm planning to do more episodes in the future. Um, you know, uh, please help. I'm locked to kill his basement. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay. That's it. Yep. I'm done. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see anything. Oh, uh, Thomas review is the new name of the podcast because we went from Austrian Thomism and we changed it because we went, this is a source from the liberalism that is Austrianism. Much as I can enjoy parts of Austrian economics, uh, has convinced us cause has, has the de facto genius of the group, um, has convinced me. Yeah. For long. Yeah. Has convinced me that Austrian, because Austria does kind of apply libertarianism, apply liberalism, and we are trying to distance ourselves from that. So we still, we still appreciate Austrian economics. I will still praise Guido Huesman with every uh, every breast I have because he's incredible. Um, and Hoppe and Rothbard Hoppe. are still right about a lot. Yes, yes. Um, speaking of Hoppe, that's it. No, we'll get into that after we go after the live stream. I'm mentioning that to you. Um, we are on TikTok now. Tell me views on TikTok. I'm going to be and clipping. soon on in- and soon on Instagram. Soon on Instagram, yes, on Instagram, Instagram as well. TikTok, YouTube, Substack. We're everywhere, baby. We're everywhere. You can't escape us. Always every, be everywhere. Every, every, everywhere but Facebook. I refuse it. But Facebook is for me to nick land post and scare my aunt, my family members. Okay? That's what it's for. Um, but definitely subscribe. Find us on TikTok. Find us on Substack. We have a – both put out an incredible article on AI and utilitarianism. Um, very funny. Very good. Very fantastic. Definitely check that right. out. Uh, abodes, both cause behemoths. Okay. He's not on his Twitter account, got disabled because he caught someone the N word. Um, he's oh Brazilian, so I've seen they get a pass did, on that one. Did, I don't did, know. Did I, t- did I tell you that I got disabled for telling David that I would slap him? <laughs> and then David commented something, but you were blocked, and it was beautiful. Yes, um, it was great. David's great. <laughs> I love David, um, yeah. Yeah. So he'll, he'll, hey, when he converts, we, we got we to gotta get him on the show at some point after he gets confirmed. Oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'll, de- I'll debate him on libertarianism. I would actually, I, I actually I will, do want to do that. I would not host because I am terrible. I've hosted two debates and they were terrible. We should, um, we should get we should get Jeremy to host. <laughs> <laughs> he just starts chiming in. Why do you fuck your dad, David? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, oh my god. Well, this has been a lot of fun. Just punches him through the screen. <laughs> Yes, the last line. It is a Bucky's hat, or as Cato pronounces it, oh, Bucky's. I got. I got to point this out. Go subscribe to the last line. A friend of mine. I just met him here at college. Um, mm-hmm. I want to have him on the show at some point because he's an interesting guy. So we're we got to get him on. You know. All Fantastic. Right. Well, you know, you, you, last line. You're a friend of Q. You're happy to come on anytime you want. This is me and DVM. Let me know. All right. Okay. Well, I think that covers it. Let me hit the exit. Um, Tati, any final thoughts? Anything nope. at all? Nope. All I think that's all. Okay. Let's. Let's bail.